Hello and welcome to The Lens with me, Sarah Travers. Now in this special one-off episode, I'll be handing over to my former colleague, Mary-Louise Connolly, health correspondent for the BBC, who met two-weight world champion boxer Carl the Jackal Frampton MBE at a recent Business in the Community event. Now Carl has proven himself as one of the world's leading professional boxers, quickly climbing the ranks by winning both the IBF and WBA Super Bantamweight belts before going on to win the WBA Featherweight Championship. If you've ever seen Carl in the ring, he was one of the most exciting boxers to watch, operating with incredible punching power, intelligence and speed. Carl's background is interesting and complex, so you'll hear more about that in this episode of The Lens. Recently, Carl worked on a thought-provoking documentary for the BBC called Men in Crisis, focusing on the troubling reality of men's mental health. So listen in to find out more about what Carl discovered and find out how business leaders can spot the signs with their people. I suppose your workplace was very much in the gym, but also at home. How important was it having someone like Christine at home? Oh, really important, I think. Yeah, just having that, that kind of someone who, I suppose she'd done everything really when I was away and, and just kind of took over, done a lot. So having someone that you can rely on and know that, know that your kids are in safe hands and everything's going to be okay. But that, that kind of, I have a close family as well and that, that you know, real family bond that we all have I think is, was really important too. Sometimes we feel... Diff- you know that it's difficult to say out loud I'm not having a good day mm-hmm. and if you know that your partner is at home with maybe two or three children w- were you able to say to others listen I, I know I'm out in the gym and it might look as if I'm not having a real life but were you able to admit to whether close family or to Christine mm-hmm. things aren't great for me L- later on in my career but maybe not not so much the family because I used to be a- I, when I was away training, I, I, first of all I trained in London and then I, I trained in, in Manchester at the end of my career, but it, it, it would have felt unfair for me to talk about the issues that I'm having yeah, that's what I when, mean. when Christine's at yeah, home yeah. on her own. So, so who I, did you talk well, to? Well, there was a big guy who was in the same boat as me, a guy called Stevie Ward, another boxer, and he, he had a young family yeah. and a wife that he left behind as well to go and try and fulfill this, this dream of his, and me and him... Without actually knowing it, we pretty much counselled each other, like, you know, just having chats on the sofa after training at night. So I I think think that was a a, a big help for for us both, really. That's really, it's really good to hear because I find in the world that I work in and suppose live in as well, it's getting a lot better, but men generally don't talk the way us women can talk. Women talk about everything and anything, we really can. You can meet a woman in the, in the public toilets while you're putting on your lippy, and you can actually start saying, God, you know, got out of the house this morning, wasn't it hard? Men don't have that same personal interaction. Do you think it's getting better that I, men I think can it, open up? It is, it is changing, it is getting better. And I think when you have guys like... He was a heavyweight champion of the world, Tyson Fury, very open about his, his mental health issues and struggles. Um, I think when you see someone like that, you know what, he's, a, he's six foot nine, yeah. you know. And he can talk about he, his feelings. Yeah, and yeah, he can talk about it and open up. So I think the more, the more we see people like that talking about it, it just it becomes a bit more normalized. But it's, it's generational, isn't it? Like my, my dad's generation, it just didn't happen. Yeah. My generation is changing, but the, my kids' generation, you hope that, that, that it'll so be So by the time better. your son comes up? You would hope that. Oh, it, it will be. Yeah. Now, you've recently taken part in a BBC documentary called Men in Crisis. How quickly did you say, yeah, I'm up for that? Um, Even though it wasn't yeah. UTV, yeah. BBC. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty. No hard feelings. Uh, sorry. <laughs> pretty quickly, if I'm, if I'm being honest. Um, you know, I, I've never done anything like that yeah. before, so... Uh, when they reached out to me to be involved in it and, and told me what what they had planned, um, I, I wanted I wanted to get involved. And obviously, there's a lot of issues with mental health, not just young men but women as well. In my area, where I'm from, North Belfast in particular, I, I know a lot of the issues and I know that, that, that some of the struggles that people have. So I, th- I thought it was just important to get involved and. Yeah. 
What I said to you coming in was, I think it's brilliant for young boys and girls to say, did you see your man, the boxer, Carl, talking? You know, hopefully they will get to see that documentary because if they see someone like you saying, I didn't have a great day or I was feeling anxious, then that'll encourage other younger, particularly boys, to, to, to own up and say the same. Yeah, look, I'm here and I'm, that's the sort of feedback that I get yes, from definitely. people that have watched it. And it wasn't really about that for me, but it's a, if that's what, what people are taking from it, then that's good. It was a, I really wanted the boys and the men that were on, this, on the show to tell their stories. But obviously then I was asked questions and I was, I was open as I could be and people, people seemed to have got something out well, of that. So. You, know, you love giving stuff, things back into the community and I think for me and something that we don't have as much are the youth clubs that we had in my day and youth clubs were somewhere to go where you met your mates. How important is that facility within a community? It's, it's massive um, and you're right there, there probably isn't as many yeah. clubs as he, when I was a kid run the I was in a club you know most nights of the week probably of some sort whether it be a sports club or or a youth club but I, I talk about my, my own amateur boxing club in, in Tigers Bay and, and I, it's more than a, a boxing club, it is a bit of a community centre yeah. and there's people that come through the doors with all different sorts of issues and, and I think the coaches and the volunteers there are the real kind of, you know, the lifeblood of the, the, of the, the, community. Of the community. Yeah, they are, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and they're trying to man manage people, different people, you know, there's some people can deal with a kick up the backside if they need it. There's other people you need to put their arm around. So my, my old amateur coach always told me that he, he, he felt like a counsellor without any sort of actual qualification. The amount of people you know, for decades coming through with yeah, different issues. Yeah. How many people in the audience are volunteers? Just in community sports clubs? Yeah, it's great. Uh, where I am in the Ormer Road Rosario Youth Club, it has Irish dancing two or three times a week. They're now building a gym upstart fundraising and get a gym upstairs for, for boxing. Uh, there's football. There's everything going through that club, but it's really run by volunteers. Yeah. What, what do you say about volunteers? No, they're, they're great people, honestly. And, and I, you know, a lot of, a lot of times, and I'm reflecting back and, and comparing it to the, the, my old trainer, Billy McKee, um, he, he kind of, there's a lot of his own family life that he missed out on as well because he's literally in the boxing club looking after these kids um, five nights a week and then traveling up and down the country as well. Um, so they're so, so important, really important. What can you do, you, Carl, to give back into the community? I, I, I think when, when you're, whether you like it or not, if, you're, if you have a bit of influence in your community, yeah. um, you should use it to have a positive effect. And, uh, and businesses can do that as well. I mean, know so many do very quietly behind the scenes. Yeah. They don't make a whole big song and dance about it, but there is a lot of volunteering and funding too. Yeah, well, and, and I think that, uh, that that's very good, obviously, and, and talk about people that do it quietly behind the scenes. Yeah. I like that as well because it's, it shows you that they care about people. It's not just about a photo right opportunity then. or anything like that. So, yeah, it's, it's really important. Right, questions from the audience. Okay, man at the back there with the blue jacket, obviously... Just, ha just happen to have a microphone just here. Just to have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask, Carl, I know you have a, a son yourself, and I was just wondering, what advice will you be giving him as he goes through his life on, on mental health? Uh, just, to, just to be open and, and, and honest with me and, and Christine, his, his mum and dad, I think that's, that's really important, and to share his stories. We have, we've been saying that to him, but I mean, I think he's a bit of a grass too. He's tell, he's, he's, <laughs> He squeals on everybody, so there's a bit of a there's a bit of a balance. But um, no, just to be honest and, and, and tell us how he's feeling. And does I he ever say to you, "But your daddy, you you box people? How can you tell me that whenever you box no, people?" No, no, not really. He's, he's not that clever. Um, <laughs> so, no, he's um, but it, no, he's a good he's a he's a he's a good kid, and um, we just we just try to tell him to be open and, and share his stories with us and any issues that he have. Most of them, to be honest, are nothing, but they seem like a yeah, big deal in yeah, his yeah, wee world. So, yeah. yeah, it's just about talking, isn't it? It is. It's all about talking. Another question? Lady in blue top. Hi, um, I'm Nola Griffiths from Heron Brothers Construction Company. Carl, I watched your documentary um, 
the men in crisis, and I, and I, I loved how you spoke to them. It was. It was a very impactful program. I was blown away by it, honestly. Um, I loved how you spoke to, with compassion and thoughtfulness to, to the guys. And what what shocked you most about making that documentary? Well, some of the issues, really, that when I spoke to the guys at, at West Wellbeing and some of the statistics that they showed me, and they, they reckon that some of the statistics that are released aren't reflective of what's actually going on, like they're worse than, than what we're led to believe. So talking about some of the people that come through their doors and the age of these people, you know, they told me about, you think of people with, with mental health issues, typically to be a, a bit my generation and younger, maybe a little bit older, but they're talking about people in their 80s coming through with real issues that they need help with. So that was that was shocking for me and, and it's it kind of, it can affect anybody, is, is what I got from that. I think what's something that emerged through the pandemic, just loneliness. Lone, yeah. And it's such a, um, a simple word, but it's a, it's a powerful thing. Yeah. Some, an older person, it doesn't have to be an older person, but I think we realised during the pandemic, how many, if you were living on your own, yeah. how many people were just so lonely? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I can't remember who it was that said it recently, but I, I, I kind of agreed completely with it that someone had said about this whole statement, the government statement that we're all in the same boat when we weren't really all in the same boat because no. yeah, I was lucky because I, you know, have a nice garden and yeah. and a bit of space around me. But you know, people living on their own in a high rise flat somewhere, they're not in the same boat as me. Absolutely so not. I, I didn't agree with that at all. And yeah, it was it was hard for a lot of people. Any other questions? Yes. It's a, it's a bit of a personal question, but I suppose it relates to a certain demographic of people too. Carol, I was just wondering, so when you're used to being a professional athlete for so long, and you're used to training and having that sort of personal time and that headspace, how did you cope with retiring and not having all that training, all that exercise and all that personal time? Well, the, the thing, I, I hated training, if I'm being honest, so it was, <laughs> it, was, um, it was my job, like, so I felt like I had to do it. It was, it was hard, a hard graft, and as the older I got, the more injuries, and um, that a lot of times train through injuries, it was it was tough. So I was looking out at the end, if I'm being honest, and, and because I understood that I missed a lot of my time when my kids growing up, like I, I just wanted to I wanted to be around them a lot more. I think one of the other saving graces for me was some I, I kind of overachieved, like I fulfilled my potential and more, um, and I'd done more than I ever thought I could have done when I was a, a, when I turned professional, so I was really satisfied with everything I'd done. There's other people who don't reach their potential, and there are the guys that I think struggle a little bit more than me, who, who regret some of the decisions they made throughout their career, but um, I, I was one of the lucky ones. I, I done I done more than I, than I wanted to, really. So might there be you might be hard on yourself, saying, "Well, because you, and you have achieved so much, what happens next? Are you under pressure to keep achieving?" No, not no, not really. Good, um, good. I'm employed now by BT Sports, so um, I I work for them on the boxing, and I suppose that. that keeps me involved in the sport that I owe so yeah. much to and, yeah. and that I love. But without doing anything too hard, literally just say what you see, you know, you watch a fight and you talk <laughs> about it. So, um, the, the easiest job in the world, I think, but it's... it's. I always think that about when the football's on in the house at the weekend, or well, actually it's on all the time in our house, and there you have this panel, you know, and they're, they're just sitting talking about what they love. Yeah. I suppose that's what I'm doing now, but they're doing it full time, talking about football. What better job can no, they No, honestly, it's great. When I, I again, like there's hundreds of thousands of boxers who don't get the opportunities yeah. that I do to, yeah. go, to go into a job like that. But so. the difference with you, Carl, is you're grounded. You come out, you make yourself available to the members of the public. You're a great family man, you're a great sportsman, and you've been absolutely fantastic here today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely incredible listening. Thank you so much to Mary Louise Connolly, BBC Health Correspondent, and to Carl Frampton, MBE for this insightful discussion around men's mental health. Every person is different and those companies that can develop a human-centred approach to their people can really make a difference. And if your business would like help and support with well-being and inclusion, 
please do get in touch with business in the community at www.bitc.org.uk. Be kind to yourself and to others. And thanks for listening and tune in next time.